Hi, Salia. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for this honor of opening your, uh, our symposium. I keep saying that this is the last talk I'm going to give on bad breath, but then sometimes there's another. So in the meantime, this is the last talk I'm going to give. The subject is bad breath, past, present, and future. Usually, I talk about the ancient past, the Egyptians, the Ebers Papyrus, uh, the ancient Jewish Talmud, uh, Islam, the Middle Ages, uh, Shakespeare. Um, today, I want to talk about uh, bad breath research in the academia. Academia. Okay, so um, in the 1920s and 30s, we find uh, the giants of the early days of uh, academic bad breath research, Salser, Fosdick. Grapp had one paper in the early 30s, but it was a humdinger when he showed uh, checking 500 uh, people that bad breath uh, most often comes from the very back of the tongue. Very important uh, piece of research. Uh, then McNamara, bacteriological research. And uh, Joe Tonzatich and his students uh, at the University of British Columbia, uh, they were my forerunners. And uh, Joe was responsible for several really critical things. First of all, taking high-level instrumental research out of the industry into university, showing that it was a bona fide uh, thing to do to study bad breath in universities, and also uh, producing many papers showing the correlation between volatile sulfur components and bad breath. I was lucky enough to meet Joe and talk to him on occasion. Um, and um, I think it was Joe's papers that I read first when I got involved. Um, as many other researchers get involved in bad breath and people from the industry, my own interest started with developing a two-phase uh, mouth rinse that began with early research uh, with uh, Professor Ervin Weiss uh, in the early 1980s. Um, then I was lucky to meet Jacob Gabay, who introduced me to InterScan and the sulfide monitor, which eventually became the helimeter. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Then I was lucky to meet Israel Kleinberg, uh, who did so much uh, research on saliva and then got involved in bad breath, showing that when saliva dries out, the smell can percolate outwards and doesn't always uh, involve uh, sulfur gases. Um, in the late 80s, I went on sabbatical to the University of Toronto uh, to work with Richard Ellen, uh, got him and uh, Chris McCullough interested in bad breath, and then uh, together with Chris, uh, we set up a uh, clinic uh, for uh, breath research, which yielded some, uh, I think, important papers. So thank you, Chris. At this time, also, um, Bill Bowen from Rochester suggested having a symposium in Acapulco uh, on bad breath at the International Association of Dental Research. That was the first symposium on the subject, and uh, Joe spoke there, and it was, uh, it was quite an experience. Um, Cy Weinstein from Warner Lambert had no problem with uh, bad breath research outside of the industry, and he funded, or Warner Lambert, the, uh, the first meeting uh, two years later in Tel Aviv, uh, in Herzliya, actually, in Israel. And uh, we had no... Uh, idea at the time that this would be the first of many meetings. Uh, and one of our surprise guests was uh, Professor Daniel Van Steenberg uh, from Leuven, uh, who got uh, interested in bad breath and uh, started ISBOR. And uh, then we had the second meeting in uh, Leuven in Belgium in 1995. And this led to the first organization about bad breath and many other meetings uh, and um, books. And uh, eventually with Anton Amann, the Journal of Breath Research. So uh, Daniel Van Steenberg was a powerful voice in persuading us that bad breath should be looked at as a multidisciplinary issue, not solely a, a dental subject. I was lucky to meet and work with John Greenman on uh, how we measure gases in particular, volatile gases, uh, and of course Salia, uh, and I worked with Avital Kozlovsky on the periodontal side of things, uh, Ilana Eli on the psychosomatic side of things, my own students, Sari Goldberg, Levitan, and of course, Dear Sterer, uh, who has now uh, published the uh, second edition of our book, probably my last. Um, and uh, of course, a shout out to the late Anton Amman and our publisher of the journal of breath research, Antigone. Um, what did I learn 
from all these years in uh, the research going forward. First of all, there's more than one kind of bad breath. You know, we tend to lump them together, but bad breath from the back of the tongue smells differently than bad breath that comes from the gingiva, and these smell differently than denture breath, uh, and they smell, they all smell different as compared to nasal odor. So these are things that we have to think about going forward. Uh, I learned that it's important not only to do in vitro research, but to interview and test individuals. We were very lucky that at the beginning of our research, people started to come to the lab and pester us, and that's how we realized that we had to do research with people and not only their saliva and what have you. Um, many things remain poorly understood. We've maintained for years that the back of the tongue is important because post-nasal drip collects there, but we don't have good evidence for that. Uh, we have good evidence that bacteria are responsible for bad breath, but we still don't know which. Uh, we have um, lots of articles showing that the helimeter was a good first-generation tool for quantifying uh, VSC in dental labs and clinics and the laboratory, but uh, better quantitative measurements are necessary, and I'm happy that there are now second and third generation instruments for uh, measuring uh, bad breath associated gases. Another thing that we um, have studied over the years is why people are not very good at smelling their own breath. Uh, if we thought at the beginning that it was a habituation, uh, we have some evidence now that people tend to have preconceptions about how bad their breath is. Uh, studies with Ilana Eli, but um, this is only scraping the tip of the iceberg. We need to do a lot more research on this problem and how we are going to help people that have exaggerated concerns of bad breath, no matter whether we call it halitophobia or what have you. One of the things that I've learned going forward is that we are human beings, even scientists. Uh, so it's okay. It's even good for scientists to have opinions differences of opinions, dogmas, but we all have to accept that we're people and we have to respect other people's ideas and opinions. And my mea culpa is I was wrong on many occasions, one of them being uh, misinterpreting our data on the lack of correlation in Toronto between periodontal depth, uh, depth of probing and uh, bad breath. Uh, later on, I realized together with Nierstetter and others that when you look at inflammation parameters, gingival, gingival inflammation parameters, you do get a very significant correlations. And uh, finally, we are going to have to get away from our gold standard of the past uh, 80 years, uh, which is the human nose. Um, not only because the human nose, uh, we, we smell the different components of bad breath differently based on our genetics. Uh, and perhaps our training, but because in this day and age it's become dangerous to stick our nose near somebody's mouth and smell the odor. So we're going to have to find COVID-safe ways to, uh, to measure bad breath. And uh, finally, I already said finally, but there's one more thing that bugs me. Um, in my uh, own career, having smelled, I think, between five and 10,000 mouths, um, it was extremely rare that the stomach could be invoked uh, or inferred as a direct source of malodor. And yet there's a handful of papers suggesting that that might be the case. Um, I think in the future there should be more studies showing whether, a, for some unexpected reason, the stomach can make a direct contribution to oral odor. So I wish all of you... Uh, a good health and continued research. Salia and friends, I want to thank you for this opportunity and have a wonderful conference. Thank you so much.